Before I offer some reflections from the gospel, on, on the reading from the gospel according to Mark, I did want to say something about the horror of the attacks in Paris last Friday night. Innocent people, those just wanting to enjoy the exciting nightlife of a remarkable and lovely city blasted away by terrorists, can cause a person to draw, at least in my opinion, only the conclusion that this is the manifestation of evil in our midst. These 129 dead were the rational enemy of nobody. Most of them were probably the ages of our daughters who were attending a concert. Noemi Gonzalez, a 23-year-old American woman from Cal State Long Beach, was killed while she was eating dinner at a cafe. It did not take much imagination for me to think that had this been three years ago in a different part of France, that could have been our daughter Jennifer. It is pure evil that for the purpose of causing people to live in constant fear, such acts of non-discriminative bloodshed are perpetrated. Of course, this is not the first time this has happened. My mind goes back to the second chapter of Matthew in which King Herod, enraged because he had been tricked by the wise men, you remember the story, killed all the male children in Bethlehem and the surrounding area that were two years old and younger. Historians actually argue as to what really did happen that day. Some estimate that it was as few as 20 children in Bethlehem, maybe fewer than that, that actually were killed. But for 2,000 years, the sheer horror of that day has remained a terrible moment during the 12 days of Christmas, because on December 28th, we remember them as the Holy Innocents. And today in Paris, the prophet Jeremiah's words quoted in that Matthean story ring loud. A voice was heard in Rama, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they were no more. Mothers and fathers today are weeping for their children. And back in California, boyfriend Tim Mraz weeps for his beloved Noemi. We all ask, what compels people to do this? We can't understand it. What compelled Hitler to do this during the Second World War? For that matter, what compelled a game warden in 1908 to shoot four Pandare Indians in what is known as the Swan Valley Massacre, just 75 miles south of here? Evil does not have a rationale. And that's one of the first things I guess we learn. So we can't figure it out. So what are we to do? Half of me says, let's go bomb the hell out of someone. I'm serious. I'm serious. Because somehow the evil has to be dissipated from our culture. And those who subscribe to the theory of a just war, which includes the likes of three World War II heroes, President George H.W. Bush, Senator Dole, and the late Senator George McGovern, who of course just lived down the road in Stevensville in his later years, and me, and many of you, may have a point in that, of going and getting someone. The other half of me says, though, that there may be a better way that I can't think of at the moment. Interestingly, when then Air Force pilot George McGovern was on the troop ship traveling towards Europe to fight the Nazis, he received a letter from his dad in which his father expressed great pride in his son and also talked about daily prayers that would be said for his safe return. Also said this, 
But, my dear boy, these are times when we need to be redeemed by God's saving grace, and you must learn to draw on the spiritual strength that is available to those who seek it. Today, of course, we pray for the victims of Paris. We pray for the people of France. And hard as it is, we also pray for those who wish to do us harm. That doesn't make any sense, but the church has always done that. And we continue that tradition today as well. And we pray for the leaders of the free world, which most certainly includes our president, who is meeting with 19 others of them in Turkey, even as we worship at this moment. And I think my prayer, and hopefully your prayer, needs to be that as they contemplate what they are going to do, which is somewhere between, I don't know, bomb the hell out of the place, or work diplomatically, as they contemplate what they will do, hopefully they will draw on the spiritual strength that is available to those who seek it. It seems very, very difficult to leave it there, in God's hands. But at least for me, maybe that's the best we have. And now something concerning the gospel we heard this morning. In a time in which the disciples must have thought that life was pretty certain, pretty predictable, not much was going to change, Jesus turned their world upside down by saying that the place upon which they were looking with great admiration would not stand. Imagine saying that to some kids walking into a soccer stadium in suburban Paris. The place is not going to stay the same. It was a conversation introducing the end of time, not a very pleasant subject. And while it might not have made sense to the disciples, it sure would have to those who first read the gospel according to Mark as it made its way from Rome to Jerusalem and all those points in between. While we might think that the writing of Mark was contemporaneous with the time of Jesus, it actually was written about 35 to 40 years after Jesus, in which people were picking it up for the first time. And to say that things were not going well at that moment in history would have been an understatement, to be sure. In the year 66, the Jewish people revolted against the Romans. And then in 70, just a few years after that temple was finally completed, it would be destroyed. And according to the historian Josephus, around a million people lost their lives in that battle. His contemporary Tacitus puts the deaths at about 600,000, but you can just imagine the carnage. This gospel was probably written in Rome while that was happening over there in Jerusalem. So not only was there turmoil brewing in Jerusalem, but also simultaneously those hearing the words of Jesus those three decades later had to believe that they were in the very midst of the conflict that the author of Mark had our Lord addressing, because it was at that very moment that Rome was burning. It would be not unlike our standing at the base of the Twin World Trade Towers in New York City on September 11, 2001, watching them come down and at that moment having someone hand you a track that says, I told you so. I told you so. Not one stone will be left upon another. And if you remember back to those days, if you're old enough to do that, you know there was not any shortage of people proclaiming that the awfulness of that day was tied to the final days that they believed were prophesied in the Bible. So, here we are now, 19 and a half centuries after the fall of Jerusalem and 14 years removed from that September 1st, and the end of time has not yet come. And six weeks ago, when we had that rare supermoon lunar eclipse 
that astronomical event, which when the moon is not only full, but it's also closest to the earth in its orbit, and there is the eclipse, an event, by the way, which we won't see for another 18 years. There were those who similarly predicted the end of the world, and of course, it did not happen. Events major and events relatively minor have been seen as harbingers of the end of time as we know it, and yet those who have been waiting for those events as a release from where we seem to be stuck in this earthly life often walk away just disappointed. Turns out a lot of people talk about the end time when they are in a state of great duress. Deliverance can only be conceived in their mind as coming through God and a catastrophic intervention. Humanity, they proffer, is an absolute mess and has contributed to persecution and oppression, and so who else can step in but God Almighty? And if not right, the listing boat of existence, then just light a match to the whole thing and start all over in the heavenly realm. And if you've been banking on the institutions around you and what was once solid and foundational in your life is now crumbling, then there is no other obvious choice in front of you except that God will somehow intervene and end it all. Except for one. There is one alternative. And the collective you and me are it. It's the body of Christ. One of the things that the disciples could not conceive of, nor could those in the sixth and seventh decade of the common area think about, was the church as we know it today. After all, nothing had yet really survived the cataclysmic fall of institutions in their experience. And so as Rome was burning over here and Jerusalem fell over there and persecution had its way winning the day as it would for another 250 years until Constantine became emperor in 313 and made the faith legal, the early church was just struggling to exist until the end of time. It had not yet survived. Basically, what fell, not unlike stones of the great temple in Jerusalem, was trust in the institutions of the state for one's security and indeed salvation. And in short, the falling of all these things, the institutions, the governments, personal quest for salvation and redemption, and even religion itself gave way to faith. In our case, Lots of stones have tumbled around us in our history and in our time, both nationally, internationally, personally. But we have continued to show up, united by baptism, fed by the bread of heaven and the cup of salvation, fortified by the prayers and the love that we share. And as a result of all that, we just continue to change the world around us because we remain that which is absolutely unshakable, and that is the body of Christ. Jesus very well knew that things important to the disciples and us would have to someday collapse by the wayside in order for us to be able to grasp that which was unshakable. And so the good news of this day in all of this is that the end of time, as people have feared it, has come and it has gone. Eternal life now prevails whether it looks that way or not. And a couple nights ago it didn't look that way, did it? But we're proof that it exists. And that simply means that we are called to continue to try our best, even when it feels nearly impossible to do, to bring relief to the poor, <coughs> shelter to those who are tossed by the storm, and good news to those who have lost hope. For Christ is the stone upon which all of us are built. And as hard as it was to believe back on September 11th, 14 years ago, 
and as hard as it must be for Parisians to believe, given the carnage two nights ago at the Bataclan Theater and five other sites in Paris, that stone of Christ still stands strong. It stands here, it stands even over there. We are witnesses to that. Amen. Thank you.